Episode 127, Ask and You Shall Receive. Welcome back to One Extraordinary Marriage, where we talk about life, love, and the pursuit of intimacy. You're here with Elisa DiLorenzo. And Tony DiLorenzo. And welcome to uh, about the midway point of summer. Yeah. For just about everybody. It has been, uh, we had a fantastic Sunday here in San Diego, um, enjoying our wonderful summer weather, spent the day with some friends, and um, it was actually a couple who was in our very first stripped down small group. Yep. And uh, that was the pilot program, the, the pilot, pilot small program group. as we were writing the book. And, and these guys didn't even have the book to use. We brought them all binders and copied what we had in Word doc. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it was a lot of fun talking with them, sort of going back down this little memory lane of where we've been over the last three years and um, almost three years, almost three years. Yeah. Well, when they were in the small group, it would have, Oh yeah. It would have been three summers ago. Yeah. And, um, so it's just a lot of fun spending the the day with them and the all our kids are about the same age and so you know the girls are off doing their thing and the boys are doing their thing and sometimes they're harassing each other and uh, sometimes like well, all there, the time there was that really quiet period when the boys were doing their own thing and the girls were doing their own thing and right other than that they're other always than, yeah, other they're than that they're always each harassing business. each other so but you know what we're not complaining this week no but i will say this <laughs> if you have kids and it's summertime and they're home a lot I can totally empathize with you if you're about to pull your hair out and go crazy because our two tend to just like to go at each other. And that's all we're going to say about it. And yet what that does though, it does add some angst and issues when it comes to the marriage, mm-hmm. you know, and it's kids important to be that. aware of that. Yeah. Um, and, and so I can tell that I'm way off feeling you know, just being able to connect with Elisa during the summer months because the kids are around so much and because we work out of the home, it, it's hard to get away and things of that nature. So if you're feeling that way, you're you're not alone because I know I'm feeling, I know Elisa most likely feels it as mm-hmm. well and others of you out there are in that same boat. <laughs> so Because we've talked to a number of parents. Um, our small group has a number of parents uh, with kids all about, our kids' ages, mm-hmm. and as much as we enjoy our time during the summer with our kids, um, it does change the intimacy dynamics. Right. And, you know, it's one of those things to be aware of to, if you're starting to feel like, wow, I'm just not connecting with my spouse, to say, you know, we need some time. We're, we're, we're falling into a little rut or we're falling into, you know, just this period of disconnectedness. We need to, you know, maybe we need date night. Maybe we need, you know, we need to budget in this week for the babysitter because we really need to get away or, you know, call up the grandparents. We've got um, one family in our small group who's part of a babysitting co-op. And, you know, they, <laughs> it's so funny. They start describing their co-op and the rest of us are all just like, oh, that sounds good and bad all at the same time yeah their Um, co-op is big so when they have all the kids what'd she say it was like 10 or 12 kids yeah i want to say it was somewhere around there so it's a lot of kids for that one night so one night from like 5 to 11 yeah and their and their date nights are long yeah so you have so there's like four or five families in the group yeah so one saturday a month you've got all the kids at your house from 5 to 11 let's just for round numbers let's just say 10 kids but then the other three Saturdays of the month, three or four, depending on the group. You've size. got date night from five to eleven. Yeah, I'm like so, can you get through that six hours of craziness to have eighteen hours? Yeah, of if co- it works, I'm like if you can if you can bring the friends together to do that. I was like, Whew. make it happen. Plus, then you're not paying for a sitter, right? I mean, think about it. Yeah. You know, maybe you're getting pizza one night that you have all the kids, and you, you know, you feed everybody pizza or whatever, and the other three nights. I mean, think of what you could do at your house in quiet for six hours. Three times a month. Three times a month. Yeah. Whoa. It's a cool deal. Going back to our friends that were in a pilot program when we first started writing Strip Down, which is going on three years now, we got some really good news. And I wanted to share it with you because we need your help. Mm-hmm. We, we seriously need your help. And so what I'm about to share with you after... You hear it, I want 
to ask you a big, big favor. Press pause and email us or call us or get in touch with us some way, somehow, because we really need your help. So to get a hold of us, email info at oneextraordinarymarriage.com. Our phone number, 858-876-5663. If you want to get a message us on Facebook, because I know a lot of you there on, are on Facebook, you can go to facebook.com slash oneextraordinarymarriage. You can hit message and you can message us there. All right, so what's this one big thing where we need your help? I had the opportunity through a connection to meet a pretty amazing pastor here in San Diego on Friday. And I just wanted to share with one, with him about One Extraordinary Marriage and what we've been doing. You know, we've rinsed, stripped down, we've done Seven Days of Sex Challenge, that book. One thing that Elisa and I have been contemplating for a little while now, for I'd say for quite some time, is trying to put together a program that's like no other when it comes to marriage. And that's sort of hard because we've been racking our brains a lot about this. And we don't know if it's a, we, we didn't know for a while if it was going to be a weekend thing, if it would be just an overnight thing. What we come up with though, and talking with a lot of folks is we're looking to do a one day intensive. And this isn't just here for San Diego. It's going to start here because that's where we're at. Mm -hmm. But the bigger picture is that we want to take this nationwide, worldwide. We want to reach as many married folks as we can where you're at in your marriage. So the big question we have for you, if there were three big issues that you would want addressed in a one day intensive, what would those three issues be? And here's the big thing, folks. We don't want to be superficial. Oh, I want to talk about communication. Communica I mean, that's, that's general. I, I understand. We talk about communication here all the time. I want ideas for date nights. Great. You guys can listen in on this weekly and we, we talk about date nights. We can talk about more date night ideas. Sure. But when we talk on these one day intensives, we really want to know the deep stuff that is really not being talked about in churches across the world. Basically, if you could design your ideal marriage seminar, what would be the topics that were covered? Yeah. You know, would you be talking about sex? Would you be talking about making your bedroom a no rejection zone? Would you be talking about the issues of pornography and marriage? I mean, these are some of the big things that if you've listened to us for a while, if you listened to us recently, we've actually hit on some of these again recently, but over the last 126 episodes, we've touched on some pretty heavy topics that we know have struck a chord with a lot of you. Emotional affairs. Emotional affairs. You know, Sexless marriage. Mm -hmm. Whatever those big issues are, folks, we need to hear from you because this isn't about us. That, that, that's what we want to get across. This isn't about us because... Elise and I could develop something, anything, but it won't impact you and those around the world who are dealing with issues because we have our lives and we know what we deal with and we deal with a lot of people too, but we really want to know if we were to come into your church next week and they were going to go, hey, there's a one day intensive on marriage, and this is what they're covering, boom, boom, boom. What, what would, would make you be? show up? Yep. What would make you look at your husband or your wife and say, you know what, we need to be there? Yeah. And the reason that we're coming to you, and it actually does tie in with um, the title of this week's episode, Asking You Shall Receive, is that you guys are our best resource. Uh, throughout the last two years that we've been on the air, two and a half, you know, every time that we have asked you for input, every time that we have asked you for prayers, you have been there. And so this time we're asking you for your insights. We want to know what you think. We want to know what we have said that has made a difference in your marriage so that we can take that, put it together with, you know, two or three other points and 
package it together so that we can take it to other marriages and churches and do seminars and, and really take one's impact and make it even larger. Yep. And, and so we are asking and we are looking forward to receiving the input that we know will come from so many of you. And, and we thank you in advance. Um, it's not often that you will that you will hear Tony say, I want you to pause an episode and respond back to us. In fact, I think this may be the first time, um, Usually he'll say, well, at the end, just, you know, write it. But you can tell how serious this is to him and to us if he says pause at the very beginning of an episode. Um, we need your help. Yep. And we need, we need your insights. We need your feedback. Um, because we can guess. But that's just, a, you know, a stab in the dark. We, there are thousands of you that listen to this podcast every week all around the world. You know, everywhere from South Africa to Canada to Holland to France to Australia, all across the United States. Uh, there are probably more countries that we don't even know that you guys are listening to us, which is always exciting when we get that email that says, oh, I'm listening to you in Japan, Alaska, Japan, Alaska. Um, so that, that, that's all. Help D- us. Yeah. Put it. Send it on in info at one extraordinary marriage dot com or eight five eight eight seven six five six six three. And those are both email and phone that you can call us, email us with any other issues you may have. All right. So let's get into this week's topic. We had an email come in that was just perfect. Um and as Elise and I were mulling over this week's show and thinking about it this just is it's a home run so literally so read it here and then we'll dive in this comes from a female listener and she says i wanted to ask your advice about a situation in my marriage related to not surprisingly sex i don't think you've discussed this in an episode before but i know you talk to lots of couples so maybe you've run into it let me preface this by saying that my husband and i have a pretty healthy sex life We have lots of open communication about sex, like about what we each like and are comfortable with and whether we're both happy with how often we're having sex. We both are. We initiate about equally and neither of us turns down sex regularly, just for normal reasons, exhausted, not feeling well. So what I can't understand is why, when my husband really wants sex, he tends to initiate in such a roundabout way, as if to avoid outright rejection that it makes me less likely to want sex because I'm so frustrated. For example, he might roll over and start kissing me passionately. If I kiss him back, he takes that as a sign that I'm willing to have sex. And usually I am. But if I stop him and ask, are you kissing me because you want sex? He'll say, I just want to kiss you. I just love you. Can I kiss you? He won't actually ask me to have sex or admit that he wants sex. Or he will take a nap and then wake up and call my name and ask me to come lie next to him. If I come in and lie next to him, he'll start putting the moves on. But if I ever suggest that his motive for inviting me into bed, if I I ever suggest that that's his motive for inviting me into bed, he'll get really offended and say he just wanted to cuddle. And sometimes he does just want to kiss or cuddle. So it's like he wants me to read his mind about what he's really asking. I've talked with him about this on previous occasions and he'll often say, You can always say no if you don't want to have sex. And I've explained that it's hard to say no to a question that's never asked. And the thing is, a lot of times I do want to have sex, or I'm not at all opposed to it, but he's so noncommittal and indirect about the whole thing that it ends up completely turning me off. We've had this conversation many times, and it always ends with the same agreement, that he will just ask if he wants to have sex, and I will tell him to stop if I don't want to do something he's initiating but we wind up in the same cycle. I don't want to reject him, believe me, but at the same time, it's hard to feel amorous when I feel like I'm being conned into having sex. Mm, that's a, that's, it's a big one. It's a big one. And you know that's really where the title of today's episode came from. You know, Ask and you shall receive. Because I love what she says is, you know, he's expecting me to read his mind. And I don't know how many conversations you and I have had with couples over the last three, four years where we basically just pounded into people's heads. Your spouse cannot read your mind. Right. 
You know, and I'm glad that she does talk about the fact that they, uh, you know, really work on their communication about sex. But this is an issue that is really, uh, you know, from the from the tone of the letter, really starting to frustrate her. And I can completely understand why. Because you and I have had the conversation. I mean, sometimes you just want your spouse to say, I want to have sex with you. I want to make love to you. Right. Period. Just be direct about it. Just ask I'm going to give you a yes or a no answer. It sounds like most of the time she's going to say yes anyhow. She just wants to be asked directly. Right. But from the, from the husband's side, and my standpoint is, is, you know, even to this point, you know, I can think of just even recently when we were coming back from the marriage retreat and it was that Sunday night and thinking, gosh, if I ask, you know, that question is going to be answered most likely with a no. So if I go in a roundabout way, I might be able to get there. Wow. I I don't even know what to say to that. (laughs) Uh. Well, it's true. You you know, that that night was sort of, mm, you know, Mm -hmm. because I just had known where we were coming off that retreat. Right. And, you know, I was... I was at a point where I was like, you know, I want to have sex with my wife. You know, I I want to have sex with her. But at the same time, I wasn't going to be forthright in asking. Because? Well, because it's sort of the, if I ask, right, there's a definite yes or no. If I don't ask, just like she said in there, if I don't ask... You cannot respond. It seems very... Um, I mean, she even says it. It's like very roundabout. Like some, And, you know, I don't think the occasional, hey, let's cuddle, it turns into sex, is the problem. I think, you know, I mean, there are definitely times that you look at me and you're like, let's have sex. You know, it, it's just a very, like, I want to make love to you. Right. Her frustration is that that never happens in her marriage. So where's the balance between sometimes I just kind of want to cuddle and it turns into more versus just uh, right. Ask what you want. Mm -hmm. The the good thing about this couple folks is that from the get go, she even says the communication is great. You know, they're communicating and even though they're communicating and we can all say we have good communication or great communication, but there's still going to be some breakdowns in places. Elisa and I still have days where we, where we have breakdowns. And this is one of those areas. The greatest thing is for them is that they already have good communication. It's going to take a number of conversations. I understand it's happened before, but maybe it needs to be approached in a different angle, in a different way. You, you know what I mean? And I can't, it's hard for us to give examples right here, right now, because we don't know all these situations and instances. My biggest thing though, a lot of it is environment. I, I think a lot of us downplay the environment we're in and don't look at that. And so that might be a conversation and start looking at that. Okay, when does this happen? You know, is it is it more when he's stressed out? When he's, you, you know. So you're talking more circumstances than environment. No. It, it, envi- the, I mean, you know, you're saying, you know, because when I hear the word environment, I'm thinking, okay, well, does it only happen in our bedroom? As opposed to you, when you say stressed, I'm thinking that's a set of circumstances. You well, know? it could be both, really. Think about it. I mean, the environment could cause that to happen, right? I mean, let's parlay this or not parlay, but use an example with food. One of the big ones I hear all the time, for those of you who don't know, we also have another site called fitmarriage.com. You can go check out. It's all about fitness and health. One of the biggest questions I always get back from there and hear from people is that I always get the afternoon munchies. Okay? So... What I always like to tell them is figure out what is causing that to happen. And it, you know, some of it could be as much as, hey, in the afternoon, you know, everybody's hanging out at the water cooler 
and I just want to hang out over there. Well, over there by the water cooler is also the snack shack or whatever else might be over there. And so that's why you're eating. Similar to your sex life, it might be, well, every time I'm in this situation, I'm, me, as the husband, deem that it's time for sex. Mm. So I hope I'm making myself clear there, but it could be that, you can call it a circumstance or the environment that you are in. Mm -hmm. And so you got to start looking at these other cues, not just these verbal, Hey, we're going to talk, but now we're going to start figuring out what's, why is that happening all the time? And I'm not getting a response back from you. I mean, what, what are these cues that are happening that trigger this Wanting to have sex, but not really asking to have sex and just sort of assuming that you're going to make love to me. And, and I'd be curious, you know, for those of you that are listening, I mean, do you find yourself in this situation with your husband or wife? I mean, do you have a spouse that has difficulty verbalizing their desire to have sex? You know, this particular couple based on what she said in the email is that they are having sex f- frequently enough that they're both satisfied. Yeah. Um, Sounds like they have some form of an intimacy lifestyle right. going on. She, you know, she talks about how they initiate about equally. Mm-hmm. Neither of us turns down sex regularly. Um, so they've got some things in place, but there's this missing link and I would love to hear her husband's side because um, it's hard to know. Yeah what the whole picture looks like. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, he may not even realize that, I mean, obviously she's brought it up to him, but he may not realize the extent of how frustrated she is. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I I get, you know, it's kind of like that. I just want you to, you know, it's it's almost like she, she wants to hear the verbalization of his desire. Right. And, And that's, I think that's really what it comes down. You know, she she it's knows he like, wants to have sex with her. It's like almost like words of affirmation. Yes. She she wants to hear those words of I desire you, I want you. And don't go don't beat around the bush, just tell me. Because it, it might be even for her, it might be even a turn on for her. You, you know what I mean? For her beating around the bush turns her off. Right. Where for her and her senses and where she is, her sensory and what happens that verbalization actually turns her on. And I would think as a husband, if you learned that you were doing something that turned off your wife in regards to sex, uh, you, you would probably stop. stop. Yeah. And, and maybe that's the conversation to have. Maybe not that I get frustrated, but maybe this makes me not want to have sex with you. Mm-hmm. You know, I want you to, I want to hear sometimes that I am so desired by you. And she even says, I mean, they don't reject each other. You know, they really have, you know, I forget exactly how she phrased it, but, um, and neither of us turns down sex regularly. So the rejection piece doesn't sound like it's really a component of their marriage. So that if he could just say, I want to have sex with you. Right. She would probably jump him. She'd be so excited to hear those words as opposed to this circuitous, well, I'm going to hold your hand and I'm going to kiss you and, well, it's going to lead to sex. And she's like, well, you know, 20 minutes later, if he had just told me, I would have been ready to go. Right. Now I'm frustrated because I just want to hear that I'm desired. And that that's really, I kind of think what my underlying sense is um, with this, that, you know, sometimes, and you've even said this, sometimes you just want to hear the word spoken. Right. To know, it is an affirmation, an affirmation of being desired, of, of being pursued. And to hear those words for, for some of us who, you know, those words of affirmation mean a lot. It, it's huge. It really is huge because it, it's just that pat on the back from your spouse going, I want you. Mm-hmm. And to hear that, you know, it, it just allows us to go, I'm loved, you know? And so 
I think that might be where this is coming in, where she is a words of affirmation type of a person going, I just want to be told that I am loved and I am wanted sexually right? instead of him beating around the bush. And it might be one of those things where, you know, those of you that are familiar with the five love languages um, with, by Dr. Gary Chapman, one of the five love languages is physical touch. Another is words of affirmation. And what I hear playing out in this email is that it may very well be that we're, that physical touch is his love language because a lot of times what we try and do mm-hmm. is take what our love language is and, and give that as right. love as opposed to giving what the other person's love language is because there are five. There's... Um, Time, physical touch, words of affirmation, acts of service. Gifts. And gifts. And, you know, when you try and give your love language, it is not always received by the other person because that is not how they receive love. Yeah. And 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 how they understand love, I guess is the better way to put that. Um, That is a great book. I think we've probably got it. Is it one of our, is it listed on the Amazon mm-hmm. on one of our resources? Oh, yeah. Um, a great way for you to just better understand your spouse. Um, it was a book that we worked through a few years ago. We actually, we did, we did a small group on it. Yeah. We yeah, did. we led a small group on it. Um, and it's a great book. And I think one of the biggest issues that I have heard from couples since we've done it to now, even at our marriage retreat, because we had a little worksheet Mm -hmm. on the five love languages, you know, go through it and see what your love language is. And they can change over time. Yep, I I truly believe it because from the first time I've done it to the time to now, it's changed. So it can change over time. But what I do here and Elisa and I hear over and over again is that my spouse shows love to me with their love language. Mm Mm-hmm. And so that really can get a spouse frustrated, obviously. Again, Elisa, I think I think Elisa pegged this one, which is his is most likely physical touch. The way he wants to show love to his spouse is through physical touch. Her love language is most likely words of affirmation. So he's gonna have to speak, she's gonna have to show physical touch. And, and I and you know, this is all very hypothetical, just yeah. from you know reading what was in this email, but it is something to consider. Yeah, listener. I mean, we're not we're not using names here, but right. listener, you know who you are. Think about this, and maybe pick up the five love languages and work through the chapters in that book to see. Okay, how are we? How are we showing love to each other, and how do we best receive love? Mm-hmm. Because I, you know, I see it with how Tony and I relate to one another. I see it with how the kids are. My kids are very different in what their love languages are. Um, and it does impact how you relate to one another. Mm-hmm. And it impacts, um, you know, it impacts those conversations that you have. And once you have a better understanding of your spouse's love language, and you understand, you know, if indeed his love language is physical touch and hers is words of affirmation, then, you know, it would be our prayer that once he understands that he needs to tell and verbalize this to her, then this little, this little hiccup in their marriage will be just that. It will be a hiccup. Um, but it definitely, this email really goes to the heart that you have to continuously be working on. And just like we were talking about communication sort of at the outset when we were talking about the one day intensive communication is an underlying thread Mm -hmm. woven throughout everything that you do in your marriage and your sex life is never going to be a done conversation. No, you know, here's a couple that has said, we talk about sex, we're having sex. We don't reject each other. We're still having this little problem. Yeah. You but know. Still, there, there's, there's still, still a hiccup here. You know, it's a journey. Right. You never arrive at the end of, of your marriage journey. 
Mm-hmm. You're never arrived. You've never got it all figured out because the day that you do that is the day that, you know, the toilet seat gets left up or, you know, the toothpaste tube gets squeezed from the middle or the trash cans don't get put out or a bill forgets to get paid. And you're like, oh, um, you know, we're, we're, <laughs> we still have to have another conversation. Yes. Yes. As long as life shall last is really a long journey. Um, but spend time this week, you know, if you find yourselves in this type of situation in your own marriage or in one where, you know, like you feel like you've had the conversation over and over again and it's not getting resolved, then maybe it's time to sit down and figure out why isn't the conversation getting resolved? Not the particular issue, but what's happening in our communication styles that's not allowing this to get past while we're having the same old conversation again. And again, going back to your environment, when are you having those conversations? Yeah. You, you know, uh, one thing we hear time and time again is, well, we're, we're tired. Well, that's not the best time to be really talking to each other then. You know, find a time when you guys can talk to each other when you're not tired. It might mean that if you both have a 15, 30 minute break in the middle of the day and you guys are on the phone. I understand we want to be face to face and it helps. But if you're coming home at the end of the day and you're doing everything you have to do and then by the time you get to bed, you guys are both so tired that you can't even keep your eyes open, it's probably not the time to be talking. You know, maybe it's time to change that up. Maybe you guys can get up a little earlier Mm -hmm. before the kids get up, hopefully. I know that can be difficult. Our little one loves jumping into our bed lately um so that that makes it even that makes it tough for elisa it makes it tough for us to have sex in the morning which is a bummer because i love that time but that's another story but change it up maybe it is a 15 minute conversation during the middle of the day during your break times you know change that up maybe it's on a weekend when you guys can get the kids to a sitter for an hour to the parents to some friends whatever it might be, think about those environments where you're at because communication is one thing and it's vitally important in each of our marriages, but we also got to look at where we are so that we can receive and give good communication. And don't let little things become excuses. Right. Don't let busyness be an excuse. Don't let schedules become an excuse these conversations that you need to have you need to have this is your marriage that you're talking about if you do not invest the time in your marriage you will find yourself not married i mean i mean that's yeah that's the reality you have to have these conversations you have to make time you can't use the well i'm too busy to do it no you're not Because I can guarantee you that for the majority of you, you will have spent the 15 minutes that you could have been talking to your spouse, checking email or on your smartphone in any given day. I'm just, I'm putting it out there. The reason I can say that is because I know I do. And we're guilty. I, I know that there is probably 15 or 20 minutes on Facebook or on email or some electronic device that I could be having a conversation with Tony. So I know if I do it, I'm not alone. Right. So whether it's you're frustrated about a particular issue in your sex life or you're frustrated about something else going on in your marriage, ask for the time to have the conversation. And when your spouse asks you to have a conversation, give them the gift of your time. Undivided. The smartphone stays on the charger somewhere else. You don't answer email. You don't pick up the phone. If you can do it at a time when kids are asleep or not around, that is ideal. I understand some of you have very little kids and that's not always an option to be completely away from them. Nap times are fabulous times to talk. And and for those of you who don't have kids at home, we're not... You know, we're not discounting you guys, just a heads up because we run into many couples who don't have kids. And guess what? We've learned you guys 
sometimes have more problems trying to talk because the house is always quiet. Mm-hmm. It's almost like a reversal. Like the house is quiet. And so by connecting and communicating together, there's actually noise in the house, which can cause a little imbalance. Yeah. And what we suggest you guys do is get out of the familiarity of your home. Maybe go to a park. Maybe go to a lake, a beach, somewhere nearby. It might mean just going across the street to the little grassy area at the church, for all I know. But get yourselves out of that environment and take the time to talk about your sex life, to share with one another what is bugging each of you. And again, we're going to have to look at this in some different ways. You may have had this conversation numerous times, but now it's time to start digging deeper again. You know, what is the environment that is causing XYZ to happen or not to happen? You know, why is it that when I initiate sex, I'm being turned down? Is it because, you know, it was a very long day or is it just because we are not connecting verbally? We're not connecting emotionally. And because of that breakdown, it is very easy for you to say no than to say yes. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, and it's what I learned when Elisa and I did the 60 days of sex challenge, Elisa has to use up her words. And sometimes using up her words meant me sitting there or lying there in bed for 30 minutes, not saying a dang word, just listening, not trying to fix her, not trying to fix her girlfriend, not trying to fix the kids, not trying to fix the house. It was just me sitting there, lying there beside her and going, you know what, honey? I hear you. Can we have sex now? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) And then at the end I would say, can we have sex now? But that was a learned process. And, To this day, there are still times when for Elisa to get to the point where she is ready to emotionally invest sexually with me, that has to happen. Now, geez, Elisa over here yawning. I I don't know. Yeah. Elisa's had a a tough weekend before 9 o'clock and she's about to pass out. Um, Mm. And for some of you, it, it may be role reversal. May mean husbands just need to just chill and let it go. And guys, husbands, do let it go. Trust your wives with you. Who else is out there who is behind you, who is with you each and every day, who loves you more than anything, who said, yes, I do to you? You need to let down your guard. You need to let her love you wholly and completely and stop holding back some of the things you may bring up may frighten her may scare her may challenge her but the reason you're doing is that you're growing closer together through those tough times Mm -hmm. and good times and i'm not saying they're tough it's just hey honey i'm just having a, a rough rough couple of months with the business with these folks that I'm managing, with the way I want to lead my career, with the kids, with, you know, this hobby that I have that it's fun and it's a hobby, but it's really just starting to drain me, you know, open up, Mm -hmm. let her know what's happening. And I do believe as we do that, we become closer together because emotionally we are so connected. The trust level is so, it's so divine that, you know, these little other issues start coming up and we can tackle them. We can tackle them. And I, and I really do believe that this couple that wrote in this wife that wrote in, I I think they're going to have a great conversation this week. And they're, and and I bet you they're going to just, it's a little, it's a little, Shift. A little tweak. Yeah, yeah, it's a little tweak and they're gonna and they're gonna be right on track. Boom. And sometimes that's all it is. Yeah. So don't the other, you know, part besides having the conversation is don't blow it out of proportion before you've had the conversation. 
Um, I'm speaking to those of you that overthink things to the point that they take on epic proportions when really it might just be a conversation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this week, as you're listening to this podcast, there's probably something that has come to your mind that you want to ask your spouse. It might be sexual, it might be non-sexual. Something in your marriage has come to mind while you've been listening to us. So you need to make the time and ask your spouse for the time to have a conversation about it this week. Mm -hmm. This is one of those weeks to have a state of the marriage conversation to say, you know what? I need to ask you something. We need to talk about this. Let's make some time this week because I want to be close to you. I want to have that emotional intimacy and I feel it's been missing in this area. So have that conversation. I think you will be very surprised at what that question will bring about in your marriage. Because it's when we're afraid to ask that things just keep getting swept under the rug and swept under the rug. And before you know it, you have this giant monster under the rug. Where if we just ask when something first comes to mind, it gets handled and dealt with and you move on and you're like, okay, great, we fixed that. Moving on. So tackle it. Tackle it now. And, ch- and you know, do that little shift in your marriage. Don't wait. All right, you guys. Well, we want to hear from you. We do. What issues would you want to hear about if you were to come to a one day intensive that could impact your marriage in four to five hours? Email us info at one extraordinary marriage dot com. Call us eight five eight eight seven six five six six three. And with that said, you guys have a wonderful week. We love you. And we'll talk to you soon.